We have 11 pet reptiles within our reptile room, but which one is the most rarest in the wild? This list is going to surprise you because you'd think this being the most common one, but it actually isn't. This list has changed drastically over the last 10 years. We're going to start with the most common and work our way to the rarest. Number 11 on the list is in this enclosure just here. Three foot wide, three foot tall, two foot deep. It's a callus versicola in a fully naturalistic setup. Why is he so fully naturalistic? Believe it or not, he took such a long time to get his enclosure and his lighting absolutely perfect. And that's because he's a wild animal. Not wild caught. Nobody went out there and poached him and brought him back. He's classed as a wild stowaway. He came to the UK in a shipping container full of wood. Over there, they were filling up the shipping container with wood to send over here so that we could build fence panels and stuff like that. That's just how it naturally works. Calips Versicola Mushu jumped into that shipping container without anybody knowing. It spent 18 days in transit on a ship coming to the UK. When they opened up the shipping container, believe it or not, he was still full of energy and bounced out. Luckily, there was a lad working there called uh, TM Reptiles on Instagram. He was a reptile enthusiast. He managed to capture it, gave me a call and said, I don't know what it is, come and help. So I did. We went around there, helped, boom. That's how we ended up with Musha. We've had to make his enclosure extremely perfect to exactly what he would naturally have in the wild because the authorities say he's such a common species. He's just like we have ants in the UK. He's such a common species that they're just going to destroy him. So I was like, no, 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 we can't have that at Northern Exotics. We'll keep it as a pet. We'll give him the best life we possibly can. And that's what we've aimed to achieve, which we've done. We've gave him a naturalistic setup. We've eliminated predators, natural disasters in there. They can last for five years in total. That's what it says. That's what it recommends. We, he, he's been with us five years now. He's still bouncing around like a lunatic. He's starting to slow down a little bit, but he's still bouncing around like an absolute lunatic. That's a callous versicolor, number 11 on the list. Now, number 10 on the list is no surprise to you guys, but this is one of the ones that has drastically changed over the last decade. Down in that closure, just all the way down there, five foot wide, two foot tall, two foot deep, a royal python. Now, granted, that one you won't find in the wild. It's a super pastel yellow belly royal python. So we're going to just use the genus, just royal python, python regis. I think that's what the Latin, I don't know. Now, 10 years ago, they were one of the most exported animals out of Africa, solely for the pet trade and for other medical uses. They're not anymore. There's been massive progress in them in the wild over the last decade, where they don't really capture them in the wild and ship around the world for pet trade. Not as much. It still does happen. There is still a massive black market for that sort of thing. But currently, they now take a lot of the wild animals and bring them into ranches. Now, these ranches can be the size of England. Massive sizes. And then they'll go around and find the eggs in that ranch and they will incubate those eggs in captivity. Solely because there is a higher incubation rate in captivity. They'll then get those eggs hatched out and then they will ship them around the world. It doesn't happen on a massive scale like it used to. Solely because raw pythons, they are easily to breed, easy to breed in the UK. They are easy to breed anywhere in the world. So the captive bred is still quite high up. But then they changed it over from wild caught to, I think they called it wild farmed now. What do you think of that process? I think it's definitely better than wild caught because some of the wild farmed animals still get introduced re right back into the wild. Think about it like this. You've got, say, a clutch of six eggs. Two of those eggs will go back into the wild. Now, two of those eggs may not even have survived if the animal was out in the wild and the eggs were left to incubate on their own in the wild. So there is still about the same amount of um, rejuvenation back into the wild doing it captive farmed by a responsible captive farmer. Some people don't do it like that, and it really should do. But we're seeing an increase in wild royal pythons because of this process and these programs that are in place there's even two organizations that go out to like the florida everglades and catch the pythons out there they then ship those pythons back to these ranches so that they the animals can live in their natural habitat but within the ranch areas let me know what you think about these programs because i kind of like them i wasn't i didn't at first because oh my god they're capturing animals but they're being put in a ranch that's the size of the uk and then they're being left to sort of do what they want and live how they want without predators. There's a massive predatory control going around these ranches. So I don't know how you feel about it. I kind of agree with it. It's better than wild caught, grabbing them out of the wild and just shipping them around the world. 
let me know what you think. Number nine, this one is in this enclosure just here, the morning geckos. Now the morning geckos, why are they so common? Solely because they carry a genetic trait called parthenogenesis. They don't need a male to reproduce. They can reproduce fertile eggs without the need of a male. So they're laying eggs all over the, all over the place, up in the trees, under leaves, absolutely everywhere. Those eggs hatch out as a genetic clone of the mother. So there's hundreds and thousands of them. They're just like, again, ants that we have in the UK. Tons of morning geckos in the wild. But there is a slight problem with that. And this is why these didn't make it at the top of the... Uh, well, these are not the most common ones. Because one slight little environmental change that could be detrimental to one female morning gecko is going to be detrimental for all morning geckos because they're all genetic... Uh, clones of the mother imagine if that mother was a Karen and well it's no longer called a Karen is it it's called an amber <laughs> imagine that and then all of those females are just ah <laughs> number eight is the horsefield tortoise this is a fairly new one to our collection just here and we've not done much videos about it but this was something for my son Jacob uh, before he moved away but he called it Ultron he's loving life in his little enclosure just there we are planning on building a massive huge enclosure with yeah it's just going to, like all of our enclosures here at Northern Exotics, we try and go naturalistic. That's what we're going to try and do for him. But in the wild, his predators are reducing in numbers due to poaching and natural disasters faster than what they are. So they're actually living out quite well. Not just that, but where they lay their eggs, the predators that would eat those eggs, their numbers are dropping faster than what these animals are. So they're actually increasing in numbers slightly more than what they were 10 years ago. The pet trade isn't as active as in wild caught tortoises no more because, again, they readily breed in captivity. So the trade is keeping that species going really well in the wild. Number seven on the list is quite a fascinating one because it has changed over the last 10 years. The boa constrictor. Now, granted, my one is a Carl Sunglow boa constrictor bred by, I think his name was Peter Carl. And you ain't going to find that in the wild. That's just not a wild uh, genetic trait or anything like that. So we're just going to use actual boa constrictors now a lot of the farmland where they're from has changed somewhat over the years now they get more money for farming a land for fruit and vegetables that sort of plant growth now for the farmers to avoid rodents coming into these areas they actively encourage the snakes to come into the areas because they eat all of the rodents that saves their crops so there's been a massive programs going on to keep these animals in their areas so they're constantly around all the time they're breeding really really well in those areas and the babies are absolutely thriving now granted you still get some uh, pet trade captures but in these controlled areas the farmers they want these animals in this land so they're going to protect those animals because it protects their farmland without costing them absolutely anything so there's a in various short colony areas the numbers are increasing massively Whereas in the not-so-colonised areas, the numbers have stabled off really nice. Now number six on the list, we're getting serious because this is something that we can all change. These animals are rapidly declining in their native natural wild habitat. That's the bearded dragon. Now, why? They don't get exported out for the pet trade solely because Australia have a law where they can't export wild animals, which I appreciate that law. I love that law. But natural disasters... These natural disasters are coming, they say, because of a climate change. The ozone layer, the air quality is all changing solely down to the carbon footprint that everyone around the world uh, gives off. So forest fires, I mean, you have a forest fire in Australia, it's going to wipe out an area five times the size of the UK and it's going to wipe out the animals that are within that as well. So they are a declining species in the wild. I will imagine that there is going to be a program to bring most of the animals back up and some protected areas and stuff like that. A forest fire will still be able to get through a protective area. So uh, we could all be mindful of the carbon footprint that we leave behind. Instead of driving to the shops, walk to the shops. The random little bits, every little bit helps reverse the climate control, climate uh, global warming. There we go. I can't speak today. That was a serious matter. Let's go over to the next one, number five. Again, this one might shock you, the leopard gecko. Now, this is declining not as rapidly as Australian species, but they are declining, and it's solely down to uh, footfall. There's a lot more people 
I'm, I'm going to be careful what I say here because there's a lot of um, stuff happening in those areas, but there's a lot more people in those areas. There's a lot more compounds being built in those areas, and that's being detrimental to the wild population of the leopard gecko. Now, again, that isn't going to affect the pet trade at all, solely because leopard geckos, the captive bred now, aren't they? You're not going to get a wild caught one uh, anywhere in the UK at all, and that's because leopard geckos are so easy to breed in the UK. We're getting towards the end of the list now, and this animal, number four, the savannah monitor, it is declining, but not really through the pet trade, not through natural disasters as much, more so through their body. Their, their skin is a sought after leather, believe it or not, the savannah monitor, a sought after leather. So don't buy goods that are made from savannah monitor leather, just don't do it. And then if there's no demand, there will be no supply. It's as simple as that. Stop buying leather off animals so that they will stop killing animals for the leather who knew i would have been a preacher like this now number three and number two are declining in the wild massively because of partly us uh, they're not reptiles they're arachnids so i'm not going to stick on them too far the salmon pink bird eating tarantula she is absolutely beautiful, but they are massively declining in the wild. We've got an Ace Amani over here, which you can't really see because she's webbed up inside a burrow. We have got a little peephole down here. Let's see if we can see her legs. Uh, no, you can't. The wild core arachnid and invertebrate trade is thriving, which it shouldn't be. There, it is balancing out to the point where in the next decade there's going to be a massive decline in wild courts and an increase in captive breeding. The one that I really like is Scott's Inverts on YouTube and I think he's on Facebook and stuff like that as well. Uh, he captive breeds a wide variety of different tarantulas, including that exact tarantula. I'll leave Scott's Inverts link down in the description down below. It's definitely worth following him if you don't like wild caught invertebrates as well. The salmon pig bird eating tarantula, their natural habitats are being devastated. They're being ripped apart by poachers, digging them out of burrows to catch them and to sell them off into the pet trade. You go to most uh, invertebrate trade shows and the majority of the animals there are wild caught and it shouldn't be happening. It just shouldn't be happening. The, the animals don't massively thrive in captivity, but it still does happen. Like I say, it is leveling off. And there are people out there actively going against it and captive breeding themselves, trying to supply a captive bred species, a, a captive bred specimen to the pet trade, which that is working. Again, you eliminate the demand for wild caught animals. You eliminate the poachers going out there to catch them. It's as simple as that. If you've got the option of a 12 pound salmon pink bird eater or a 30 pound salmon pink bird eater, buy the 30 pound one provided you can guarantee that it's a captive bred. If you can get a salmon pink bird eater that's this big and it's only a year old, that's a wild caught one and the supplier is lying to you. It takes them, that one there is a female. They can live for like 15 years quite happily, whereas a male will mature after five years. The male will then walk around, find a female, do the deed and then get eaten by the female most of the time. And again, the captive breeders are sorting that out in the way that they try and separate them at once they've bred. There is so much activity going on for both of those species, the Ace Amani and the Salmon Pink Birdie to Lassiodorus Parabana. I'm probably going to get some hate because I've probably said that wrong because I've had loads of heat in the past for saying it wrong. Don't buy wild caught. Come on, guys. You all know better. Don't buy the cheapest one because... Uh, and just act dumb. Oh, I didn't know it was wild caught. Put your effort in to find out whether that animal is wild caught. If your supplier can't guarantee and tell you exactly where it come from, then don't buy it. Just on the off chance that it might be a wild caught specimen. My rarest pet reptile resides in this enclosure just here, a horizontal vertical uh, bioactive tropical douche. Ah, oh, he's in shed, green tree python. Now he <coughs> is one of the rarest and had a massive decline in the wild in the past sort of mainly four or five years to be honest and solely because there's been a protective um protocols pro 
plans in place to protect a certain species out there, but that species is an egg eater and it's been eating all their eggs. So they are on a massive decline. I mean, that one, you won't find that exact one in the wild solely because that's a Bayak cross Sarunk green tree python. Um, that's two basically islands where they've been bred together and stuff like that. They ain't going to be able to breed together in the wild because they've got to cross water to do so. That's why they're, they're um, the most rarest. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I really appreciate you all. If you've not already, subscribe.